David Kindop, writer, author, and a person that really causes us to think, sometimes <laughs> even when we don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> even, yeah. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. <laughs> you wrote an article recently for the Matsalon Messenger that was the subject of safety in the United States versus Mexico. What was the title of that particular article, David? The title was Gringos Head South for Safety. <laughs> <laughs> and how's that working out for the Gringos? Well, actually, it's working very well for the Gringos. They may not know it, but it is. <laughs> well, because, you know, everybody's worried about, everybody's worried about Mexico, about going to Mexico and getting gunned down by the cartel or whatever, right? I mean, that's a big deal in the news. And I think the Canadian government just recently issued another warning about travel warning in Mexico. Well, I got to thinking about that. I was looking at something, I had to do with maybe uh, Guzman, who they just arrested again, the big drug lord who hangs out in, in a town uh, uh, called, mostly he's near Cuyacan and he's in a little uh, mountain outpost kind of near Mazatlan, which is you know where I've spent some time. and and. What I write about typically when I write about Mexico is Mazatlan, and and that's the state of Sinaloa, and and that has kind of a bad rep in the press. The state of Sinaloa as the Sinaloa cartel, and everybody it's dangerous to be there. You know, you can't walk the streets and all those kind of things. So, I started looking at the uh, at the statistics. The Mazatlan Messenger actually ran a little piece that talked about how many people were killed in the state of Sinaloa in I think twenty. 15, and how many were killed related to drugs, you know, the drug, uh, uh, the drug uh, uh, cartel scenario. And it turns out that in, the, in this state, there were like the 270 people were killed in 2015, not drug related, out of a population of, I think, about three and a half, about three and a half million people, I'm not real sure. So, if you look at the, the statistics around the United States and various places in Mexico, and, and some places in Latin America, what you find out, in a lot of ways they rate, they rate the quote-unquote murder statistics are per 100,000 people. That's what the common way of rating it. Some, some do it per 1,000, but I, I extrapolated that. And the bottom line is, is that if you look at the at the, uh, the statistics and the, the murder rates, for example, uh, I think St. Louis, Missouri in the United States, Atlanta, uh, Detroit, uh, uh, Oakland, there's a lot of, there are a lot of cities in the United States that have a murder rate vastly higher than, than the state of Sinaloa. Now, it has been pointed out to me that it's maybe an unfair comparison to compare statewide statistics with citywide because there's higher concentrations of folks in the cities. And that's, that, and that is, that, and that's valid, uh, but if you even take the overall statewide statistics for many states in the United States, it's a lot higher uh, murder rate than it is in Mexico. And, and people have a hard time believing that, but it really is true. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in fact, gathering up the statistics, there's one interesting statistic that in 20, the, the last, the last stats for the, that were available for these various sources were 20, 2014. And in 2014, with the permanent residents that are, they, that are in Mexico, and I think the State Department estimates that there are about a million gringos that live in Mexico full time, all right. around the country, and right. you know, working for companies that are retired. <clears throat> and so when you count those people, and in 2014 they estimate that 22 million uh, U.S. citizens visited Mexico, either crossing the border to work or traveling or whatever. 22 million, plus the million people that live there. So that's about 23 million people that were in Mexico in 2014. And of those 23 million, 100 of them were murdered. Now. That, that rate is something like 0 .004 per 100,000, and that is unbelievably low. Uh, it's, so, 
it's an odd way to look at that in terms of, well, they're not there permanently or all that stuff. And, and I wrote this piece and somebody pointed out to me, well, come on, those people were just passing through or whatever. But the way I look at it is, well, so what? They were just passing through, but they didn't get harmed. Right. You know, they could have been just passing through in St. Louis and their, their uh, <laughs> chances of being harmed would have been 10 or 15 times greater. In our country. In our country. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Statistically, that's, that's absolutely true. And so, what I believe is true, and based on the statistics, and you know, you can skew the numbers any which way you want to, but I think it, they really speak for themselves in that, technically, you are safer in Mexico than you are in the United States, in terms of being um, killed. Well, how about here, in our beautiful little Eureka? Oh, in Eureka? <laughs> <laughs> in Eureka, it's, uh, I think it's, I think the rate is 19 people per 100,000, which is higher than Oakland, California, Richmond, California, way higher than, uh, it's higher than Mexico City. And you, so if you compare city to city, to be a fair comparison, it's higher than St. Louis, it's high, it's not higher than St. Louis, but it's higher than Mexico City, it's higher than Richmond, California. Uh, it's higher than a lot, a lot of places in the in the country, and even in California. So our peaceful, beautiful coastal heaven out, here out in the middle of is nowhere. more dangerous than Mexico. Absolutely, statistically, yeah. And that, oh. and I close. I think I mentioned in my piece, which is something that I, I thought, <laughs> I thought quite interesting, was that. So when you look at the statistics, I'm I'm actually safer driving over to Pancho's on the beach in Mazatlan for a burger than I am going down to the co-op to get my organic broccoli <laughs> Whoa. in Eureka. Whoa. It's, it's how we look at it. Uh, yeah. It's how we look at it. We're, we're familiar with what's going on here, and so we don't sense the danger so much. We go to Mexico, and we go to, let's say, I'm going to the co-op and I'm going to go grab some organic broccoli. Right. Well, I pass some unsavory characters on the way. I walk around. I see some folks that look a little weird. I pass somebody maybe who's, you know, who's got a leather coat with 48 studs on it. And, you know, they, <laughs> they got a funny looking watch cap and they've got 86 tattoos. But I, they're everywhere. So it's like, oh, well, I'm a little, he's a little weird, but... Well, here, we accept it partly as the style. It, well, yeah. Because there's so many of them. Right. Yes. So, and, and that person may or may not be dangerous. Right. But they, I would say, statistically, they are more dangerous than if we're on our way to Poncho's. We park our car somewhere. We walk three blocks to go to Poncho's restaurant. We're walking down, and we're right, you know, it's on the beach, and we're near the beach. But we pass, let's say we pass some scruffy-looking Mexican, and he's, you know, I mean, you know, maybe he's got some a dirty shirt, and maybe he's got a little bit of growth and all that. But our instinct is, from north of the border, with our perceptions is, oh, God, that person's dangerous. And that person is probably just a regular guy who can't afford a razor, you know? <laughs> I know a lot of people like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I find that really interesting because, because we, we look around, and, I, and I'm guilty of that. I go to Mazatlan, I go to Mexico sometimes, and I see somebody, and I, I, think, I think they're dangerous. But they're not. They're just, they're, just, they're just a guy. They're just somebody hanging out. And 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 here, they, statistically, they are they are more dangerous. Well, also we have a built-in thing that dangerous people look dangerous or different or weird. The truth of the matter is that a lot of very very dangerous people look like fine businessmen because they are yeah, that, that's on the true. other side yeah. of the law, but they are right. Okay, yeah, yeah, they really true. are. They drive fine cars. They right. wear fine suits. They're diplomatic with people and. Uh, they're doing just fine, but it's all illegal. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, and I think part of it, too, and, I, and I've, I vaguely touch on this, but part of it, obviously, is that in Mexico, you're not allowed to have, well, you're, you are, but I mean, everybody and their brother doesn't have a gun right. in Mexico. In the United States, the last statistic that is available that I found was that there are 330 million people in the United States. That's men, women, and children. And there are 350 million guns. 
more guns than every man, woman, and child in the country. Now that's a recipe for getting shot. Come on. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. I mean... <clears throat> so guns are for shooting and somebody's going to use them, is what well, you're yeah. saying. You know, and I love the old idea about, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. You know, come on, give me a break. I mean, how many people, how many people are murdered or killed with a gun in a, in a, in a passionate moment that would have never happened right. had they not had access to that, that weapon? Right. <clears throat> and, and also in Mexico, <clears throat> also in Mexico, people don't walk into schools and colleges and restaurants and indiscriminately shoot 15 or 20 people. It just doesn't happen. The mentality in Mexico isn't, I don't think even the worst wacko in Mexico, their mentality doesn't include killing children. It just doesn't, it's just not their part of their culture. Right. You know, and and yet here, we do that. You know, we have we, it happens, and and that's scary. In fact, <laughs> when I wrote this piece, I came up, I came across a really interesting article. I think it, I don't know where it was, Texas maybe. You know, surprise, um, where this thirty-year-old father, absentee father, was watching his kids when their grandparents went somewhere for the day. Or the weekend, and he he was he was watching his kids, his uh, daughter who was about eight, and his son who was about seven, and he had a, a handgun out, and he was twirling the gun, and he was pretending to shoot the kids, and he shot his daughter in the chest. He, and 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 the, and the son said, well, his dad was, his dad said he liked the sound of the clicking of the gun. And he was pointing the gun at the kids, and he shot his daughter in the chest. Miraculously, she survived with eight surgeries oh. and so many days in intensive care. But this, we got this wacko who's literally, you know, and the father said, oh, I was showing my kids gun safety. Oh. And he shot his daughter in the chest, an eight-year-old daughter. I mean, and, and you, you know, if you read about gun accidents in this country, it's just, it's laughable when you, when you go, when you, when you Google what people, how people shoot themselves and other people. Oh, it's, it's just amazing. <clears throat> well, it says something even more terrifying about us. We're afraid of each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're really afraid of each other. And we need to do something really serious with the security level of the people in this nation, in their thinking. You know, <clears throat> people sort of navigate toward what they entertain, and if they're afraid, they're going to buy a gun. Sure. And, and and if they're more afraid, they're going to use the gun. Oh. Right. And they're becoming actually walking directly into that thing of which they're so terrified. Right. Right. And they're we're unwittingly aware of that. Now I'm not saying that we can just be oblivious and imagine that danger doesn't exist. Oh sure. But I am saying that harboring <laughs> the fear of anything <laughs> is a magnet to that fear. Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and our thinking as a nation is so fearful and so judgmental. I mean, look at the politics. Look at the politics today. We are again, <laughs> again, being terrified, not logically introduced, but terrified by people in the political field that want us to follow them. If you don't follow me, it's going to be the end of the world right, type thing. Right. How often have our political leaders and religious leaders terrified us oh, into yeah. giving our allegiance to them. Right. It's a strategy in our country. Oh, sure. And it's sure. really it's really, really a sad one. Oh, it's a yeah. sad strategy. Right. Yeah, and, and and you mentioned, you know, about what you think about, what you fear, and and, and some people can and some people can't relate to this, but there there are a lot of people who espouse the philosophy and the truth, really, the truth is that what you think about expands. Yeah. And and what you what you most seriously desire or what you what you are very much afraid of expands. You're yes. drawn to either yes. one of those. And if you spend a lot of time in fear, right. then that's what happens. That's what shows up. And we yes. do, and collectively we spend a lot of time in fear, as you say. So that's what's showing up. Yeah. 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 No, because because <clears throat> it's just well we can see it with the animals and we accept it. Right. If a dog's right. afraid of you, he's more apt to bite you. Right. If you can project, and dogs are sensitive, and I do mean project, a like for the dog, he's apt to be confused but stop barking. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We've, I've, <laughs> I've, 
I've done this just to see if it works. Uh, yeah. You know, I have a, a neighbor up the street whose dog comes out and almost throws himself through the fence and angry wow. barking at anybody that goes by. So I stop and whine at him like a puppy, and he gets very confused. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, well, maybe it's not nice, but it's a fun game. There's still a fence. <laughs> yeah, there's still a fence. Right. There's still a fence. But the principle is what I'm talking about. Right, right. You know, if we're afraid and we act on that fear, that's okay as long as we are in control of the logic of cause and effect and mm -hmm. the involvement of that right, fear. Right. Well, and, and you know, it's interesting because. Mexicans don't spend a lot of time in fear. They definitely do not spend a lot of time in fear. They're like, oh well, you know, yeah. and they move on. <clears throat> because for a lot of folks, I mean, not only is it something, I think it's like something that's, <clears throat> it's almost like it's genetic. I don't know what it is, but something happens and they're like, oh well, you know. And they just, they don't think about things like, well, I'm going to get even with you, you know, or I'm going to go get a gun and shoot you for that. I mean, you took my parking space, you know. I mean, it, people play music until four o'clock in the morning loud and they disturb the whole block and people are all upset and then the next day it's like, oh well. Or even during it, during it, so oh well, you know, because maybe they're going to do it the next week or the next party or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is way better than, you know, uh, hey, in this country, if, if that, in a lot of parts of this country, if somebody's playing their music until three in the morning and you told them to stop and they didn't, they'd go grab one of their five guns. <laughs> And they start shooting, you know. <laughs> I hope they wouldn't get that, but but I get the point. It's a pretty dramatic example, Dave, but that I, I but I get it. Well, you know, in, in many years ago, in the town of Mendocino, uh, on the coast here yeah. in Northern California, I mean, 25 years ago, there was a case where there were a guy was pulling in, a guy pulled into a parking spot in a grocery store, and somebody was going to pull in and take the spot, and they didn't get it, and they got pissed off. The person who didn't get the space got a handgun, got out of their car, went to tell off the person who pulled into the space, they got in an argument, and shot him. Dead. Wow. Well, maybe that wasn't a bad example. <laughs> maybe I'm just like... I mean, it happens. Um, it's it happens. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a, you ever see there's a joke on the internet about, or there's a little video on the internet, and it talks about tex being uh, shopping in Texas or something, wine shopping in Texas, and it shows this woman and she's milling around this liquor store and... And, and there's a sample where you can pull up this cork out of this bottle and she and there's all these customers hanging around. It's a very high class place and she goes Pow! and she pulls the cork off and it goes pow and and eight people swing around and have their guns drawn. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. And I'm not you know and I and I understand, you know, guns and the you know I understand that, you know, the right to keep and bear arms and all that stuff. I, I get that. That's cool, you know. But there's there's a there's a time and place for for guns and that kind of thing, you know. I just think it's it's fascinating. And when you there there are places in Mexico where you go in and it says "Welcome to Mexico, gun no guns allowed," you know. Yeah. And if you bring a gun into Mexico, you're probably going to go to jail. Yeah. And 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 there, in fact, there was a and I'm not you know, I'm not doing this to advocate gun control necessarily, although I don't think it's a real bad idea to some degree. But there, I think. Australia or England or one of those countries in the last 20 years they had a real battle political battle about getting rid of guns they bought everybody's guns back and everything and everybody hated it and you're taking away our rights to defend ourselves and they went through that whole thing that we go through all the time right. in this country the net result of that was that 20 years later their uh, murder rate is practically nothing compared to what it was before wow. they implemented wow. that yeah well I understand the fear because as it is making people register their guns and whatnot isn't the problem mm -hmm. because the criminals are the sure. ones that steal the guns and the criminals are the ones that create the crimes and the criminals are the one they are afraid of. Right. And they feel stripped naked because the criminals right. just get booked and let go. We don't have enough cops. Right. And I understand fear. Right. I really understand oh, sure. the fear. Yeah. And I understand the reaction to the fear of being excessive sometimes right. and then the problem escalates. And if we have a whole mindset of controlling people through fear, like I said, with our pol right, politics right. And, and everything we do, we control people through fear. Right. I mean, look at the cultural <clears throat> upbringing of a child. Right. Instead of teaching the child the cause and effect of their behavior, we punish them. Uh, right, for right, their behavior, right. uh, we're off on the wrong foot to start right, with. Right. 
pers that's my thinking. But yeah. Well, there's an I, there's an interesting thing that happened to me in Mazatlan about violence, and uh, or the threat of violence. And I'm writing a piece about that. It's going to be in my next book, which is going to be the collection of short stories. Yeah. You know, uh, which hopefully will be ready soon. I'm, it's I keep saying it's going to be ready soon for a year. You know, but it's going to be ready soon. Manana. <laughs> Manana, right. <laughs> So, I, I, Roberto asked me if I wanted to go to visit his brother on Christmas. I said, sure. You know, I was living next door to him in a house that he owned. I was renting from him for a while. And he's going to go visit his brother up in this little town called Dimas, which is about north of town, near the near little village, near a village on the coast, yada, yada, yada. And so, okay, we go. Roberto, his wife, his two daughters, we pile in his van, we drive up to Dimas, we pull in, and next door... There's a house, and this is a brick, funky house, and they're all pretty funky houses. But next door was a little nicer house, and big lots, you know, they're on spread out, dirt roads, you know, that thing. And next door, there's, I don't know, five or six guys hanging out, all with their nice clothes on, and their big watches, and their radios, they're on walkie-talkies, or ham some kind of radios, VHF radios. And they're all in big, nice trucks and SUVs. And I think, eh, that's weird. Well, you know, maybe they're all coming home from the city to visit mom or something, you know. And so uh, we're with his brother, and we find out, I find out through the course of inquiry, which I do, well, and his, what his brother says, well, these, they're just, these people next door, they're, uh, they're killers. They work for the cartel, and they're killers. And I'm thinking, whoa, you know? And I don't, I don't, doesn't that make Isaac nervous or anything? He says, well, you know, a little bit, but they don't bother us, and they only kill people that they're ordered to kill, and they're often other, other cartels, you know? And rival cartels, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, you know, and so then, <laughs> and then, and, and it's like, yeah, well, and then we drive, uh, we want to drive around the corner to a place where Roberto and I visited 20 years ago, and kind of look at, the, take our picture in the same place, you know, and all that, and we drive, and we drive by, slowly drive by all these people, you know, and they're all, and we drive by, and they look at us, you know, like, whoa, I mean, you, I could see in their eyes the ability to pull the trigger. You know, without remorse. These guys yeah. were cold, calculating. They're all like 30, 35 years old. Yeah. And uh, so I look, and they look at us, and then we kind of come back, and one guy pulls out, and Roberto says, I'll wait for him to go. I, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to piss him off. And I kept asking him, well, is, doesn't that make you nervous? He said, well, people get a little bit nervous, but we can't do anything about it, because nobody can ask them to leave, because they won't leave. And, uh, and, he, and, and he said, well... Basically, they don't bother us, and, you know, I said, what about me? I'm a gringo here, and, you know, in this town, there's no gringos in this little town. Zero. And here I am with, you know, you and this van, this funky old van. I mean, what do they think? And, they, and my friend said, what do, they, what do they think? You're a DEA guy? You're too old to be a spy. <laughs> you know, you're just, a, you're just a gringo hanging out with us, you know, on Christmas. Yeah, they don't care. I mean, they were looking at me. But, they, you know, I'm sure in 10 <laughs> seconds they sized me up like, oh, yeah, shit, he's just an old Ringo. You know? Yeah, besides, if you, if you were a powerful person, you'd have a fine car. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. I'd be driving my black SUV. Yeah. <laughs> but it's really interesting, the whole attitude, you know, about that. It's just, yeah, hey, it, it is what it is. In Mexico, when you were there, the acceptance of what is, you know, we can't do anything about it, we just accept what is. That's a state of mind that evidently, in some ways, brings them safety. In some ways, perhaps they lose their control of what's happening in their life. Define that, David. I don't know if you can define that. But you're right. That's a real interesting conundrum, if you will. Because yeah. you, they, people do give up a lot of control in their lives. They, right. they, they acquiesced to corrupt government and corrupt police officers and, and you know and the oligarch and the fact that Mexico is an oligarchy, right? And, and and which we're now having to adjust to in this country, by the way. But they've adjusted to that and so they've given up a lot of control, but in giving up trying to control what they can't, they've gained a lot of control. And in other words they've gained some sense of you know, it's like what is it? God help me change the things I can and, and don't worry about the things I can't, you know? Yeah. And 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 I think what they've got what they've established is this sense of it is what it is and this is these are these are things this is these are walls that I can't move or climb over typically. So this is where I'm at, so why don't I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy where I'm at. 
Uh, and I think that's why you see people having fun and laughing and kids are playing and, you know, uh, they all, like the old story of the kid playing with a cardboard box yeah. and getting a lot of enjoyment out of it. I mean, there's a certain amount of, of uh, jadedness that's creeping into their society because, of course, there's cable and there's internet and all this stuff and more and more people want more and more stuff. Right. But even then, you know, my friend Roberto and his family, you know, they don't have a lot of stuff. And they're, they're pretty darn happy. Pretty darn happy. And that's a huge lesson, of course. To accept the things we cannot change is actually a gift. To change the things that we can creates courage. Right. And to be able to know the difference, difference. Right. Right. is the final bottom line. That's the tricky part. That's the right. tricky part. Yeah. And when we know what we can or cannot do, to make our life, our neighborhood, our family, our country better. Right. If we would each, where we're at, where we're at, do whatever right. we can where we're at. Absolutely. We could change a lot. But most of us don't know where that line is. Right. right. What we have power over and what we don't have power over. Right. Instead, we stand back and cry, basically, have a tantrum or wet our pants. Right, right. And that's kind of the mindset we imagine that we have to have a big enough tantrum that somebody else will do it for us. And here we are coming back to the concept of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Are we going to make enough noise to have an effect by our vote rather than by our hurting one another? Right. Can we see that that may be the only way we can possibly make a difference? Or are we going to create chaos? Mm -hmm. And that is a huge question, even in this country today. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just and, and kind of circling back, you know, to being safe in, in Mexico, I just want to mention that I've spent a lot of time in Mazatlan, and I've walked home at 2 o'clock in the morning, in the middle of the night, and, and, and in town, and in Centro, and whatever, and uh, driven all around, I've driven all in the barrios and in the, in the, in the, you know, the poor neighborhoods. There are a couple of places you're not supposed to go in Mazatlan. I've never, ever once felt in danger. Right. You know, I never felt like I was in, in my, my life was in danger. Right. And I think that's pretty amazing because I cannot say that about many, many places in this country, in this state. Right. You know, I would not walk down through any number of places at 2 o'clock in the morning. Right. Yeah, and I wouldn't do it. In Mazatlan, I have no fear at all. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm sure a lot of people will love to hear that because Mexico is attractive and it is beautiful and it's economical and it's close. Right. And it's right. exotic. Right.